We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Presenting Officer, yesterday I had the great pleasure of meeting the Ambassador from El Salvador, and today I'll have meetings to take forward the, the Government's programme for Scotland. Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much. I would like to ask the First Minister a familiar question about whether a separate Scotland would be a member of the EU. It's a question Andrew Neil asked him on 4th March. Have you sought advice from your own Scottish law officers in this matter? Starting his answer with the words, we have, yes, could the First Minister please get to, no, we haven't, in 27 words? <laughs> First Minister. Well, the, uh... First Minister, order. The 27 order. words that Joanne Lamont refers to are, of course, the words which were taken out of the Labour Party's <laughs> press release. So, I, I, I don't think it's a, a great a, argument to attack the probity of government when you then remove 27 words from your press release. Not, not the most ingenious tactic, even from the, uh, the, the Labour Party. Uh, but, uh, and yes, of course, Scott Independent Scotland will be a member of the European Union. Yeah. Presiding yeah. officer. Yesterday, the Member of the European Parliament, Catherine Styler, wrote to me asking me to formally investigate whether the Ministerial Code had been broken in relation to the existence and content of legal advice on the independent member, uh, Scotland's continued membership of the European Union. Uh, I can confirm to the Chamber that I today have agreed to that request by referring the matter to the Independent Order. Panel of Advisers on the Ministerial Code. Because this matter touches on an area of the Code which relates to the Law Officer's prerogative in terms of the existence and content of legal advice, uh, and our two members of the panel are both distinguished former Lord Advocates, and the advice of the Permanent Secretary, I have invited Sir David Bell to join the Independent Panel of Advisers. Sir David is Vice-Chancellor of Reading University, a former Permanent Secretary of the UK Department for Education. He will lead the investigation into this matter. Officer, the, the finding of the independent advisers will be made public. I will accept them, and I hope that all members of this chamber will do the same. Yeah. Uh, I would observe that there have been five references since I've been First Minister, and each one has found uh, in favour that the ministerial code has been abided by. I hope on this sixth occasion, given I've said I'll accept the findings, that the opposition parties will find themselves able to do the same. In amongst all of that, the First Minister astonishingly asserted what Scotland's position would be in Europe post-independence, despite, despite the fact that in five and a half years he hasn't asked a question and he now tells us that when he gets the answer he's not going to share it with us either. Now the First Minister talks about the interview and the 27 words. I have the transcript here. The First Minister seems to be asking the people, as Marx, Groucho Marx that is, asked before him, are you going to believe me or the evidence of your own eyes? Well, I suppose you can't expect a straight answer from a minister, first minister who's as straight as a corkscrew. But let's try again. Why did the first minister... Why did the First Minister... Order! Why did the First Minister say that he had sought advice from the law officers when he hadn't? Why did he give that impression to this chamber? And why did he go to court at our expense to stop the release of advice he knew didn't exist? First Minister, order. Well, of course, uh... If that First were the case, Minister. the Labour Party wouldn't have found it necessary to admit the 27 words across free answers from their statement. Uh, the uh, point uh, is this, and let me see if I can uh, explain it to Joanne Lamont, that you uh, are bound by the Ministerial Code in terms of uh, asking for specific advice on a legal question from the law officers, and you're bound not only in terms of not revealing the content of that advice, but revealing the existence of that advice. And many times in this chamber, and I'll cite them for Joanne Lamont, she wishes I've upheld that. There is a second process, however, and that is quite different, and that is that every major document 
uh, which is published by this government, is underpinned by law officers' advice. When they ask for specific advice, the law officers give, in their opinion, what is legal. And when you look at the underpinning of documents, the law officers will point out anything which is obviously against the law. That is the difference. It's a distinction that I've made a number of times in this chamber. It is absolutely clear when you read the full interview with Andrew Neil that what has been talked about is in terms of both the debate and the documents. That's why this section of the interview finishes by saying the documents that have been published are consistent with the legal advice we have received. That is exactly the format that was said. In terms of, uh, of the government's defending the ministerial code, uh, uh, in terms of uh, court action. I, I've been doing a little bit of research. <laughs> and I now find that the Labour Party were bound by the uh, Freedom of Information uh, Act for, for two years. In that two years, they took five cases to the court of session to defend these principles and on disclosure. This uh, relates and compares with the two cases we've taken in five years. Oh. So I, I just say to Joanne Lamont as gently as I can, because she was a member of, of that litigious government yeah. uh, in the Labour Party, that if you've taken five cases in two years to the court of session, then you're in no position to preach to other people about how you allocate public money. First Minister, Ms Lamont. Order. Order. I have to say to the First Minister, in the gentlest of terms, given the seriousness of the charges that have been made to him, the idea that that constitutes any kind of answer is completely ludicrous. <laughs> the people of Scotland need to trust what he says, and on that performance, yeah. they certainly don't. He says we can't say we're even asking for advice. The Deputy First Minister stood here on Tuesday and said that she was asking for that advice. Why does it have to be secret? But the reality is this, and this is a serious issue. The First Minister wants an honest debate about what is going to happen to the future of Scotland. So he starts it by asserting, and he did it again today, we would be in the EU but wouldn't have to join the Euro. But the First Minister doesn't actually know because in five and a half years he hasn't asked. Yeah. Yesterday, the Spanish Foreign Secretary, yesterday, the Spanish Order. Foreign Secretary said Scotland would have to apply to be in the EU and would be at the back of the queue. The First Minister says he's wrong, but he doesn't know because he hasn't asked. The First Minister says we would keep the pound, but he doesn't know that either because he hasn't asked. The reality is, the reality is, the First Minister will say anything to get through the moment and then ask us to take his assertions on trust. But doesn't he realise after this week nobody trusts him? First Minister, I thought, uh, order, First Minister. It has lasted for some considerable time that Joanne Lamont would have taken the precaution of at least reading the Ministerial Code, yeah. uh, since that's what the debate is. Because she just made the contrast. She asked why I couldn't reveal the existence of legal advice, while Nicola Sturgeon this week uh, told the Chamber that we were seeking specific advice on this question. Can I point her now to understand and read the Ministerial Code? Paragraph 2.35. The fact that legal advice has or has not been given to the Scottish Government by the law officers and the content of the legal advice given to them by them or anyone else must not be revealed out with the Scottish Government without the law officer's prior consent. When Nicola Sturgeon obtained Order. the law officer's prior consent, then she was able to tell the Chamber that we were seeking the specific legal advice. Now, I, I would have thought, uh, given that the Labour ministers upheld in the same uh, ministerial code, that that at least, and John Lambert was a Labour minister, then that at least would now be understood uh, in terms of this debate. Uh, and I hope that uh, now that's been cleared up for John Lambert, she will uh, accept it. In terms of the... Order. Well, it's quite clear. It's the prior consent. Order. I 
didn't have prior consent, Nicola Sturgeon did have prior consent. Is that really complicated? In terms of the, the Spanish debate, uh, can, I, can, I absorb, uh, can I direct, uh, can I direct uh, Joanne Lament to the, the comments of uh, the Spanish Foreign Minister on the 24th of February this year? Quote, if in the UK both parties agree that this is consistent with our constitutional order, written or unwritten, Spain would have nothing to say, just as this does not affect us. No one would object to a consented independence for Scotland. And this brings us to the, the key point. In the Edinburgh Agreement, under Clause 30, Order. the process by which independence for Scotland could be secured was agreed. That is the point that the Spanish Foreign Minister was making this year. Under these circumstances, we have sought the advice of the law officers, and that advice will be informed the White Paper on independence. That seems to me a substantial progress in this debate, giving Joanne Lamont the information that she claims she needs. Ms Lamont, order. I am asking for the information the people of Scotland require to make the decision in the future. And of course, the First Minister says the difference between him and the Deputy First Minister is that she asked permission to tell us that she was going to get advice. Could he not have asked permission to tell us that he hadn't asked for any advice? You, know, you might find this hard to believe, but actually I do feel for the First Minister. All his life he has fought for this, and now he knows his argument doesn't meet the times. Now he knows, now he knows it doesn't make sense for Scotland. So he makes things up instead. No one wants the euro, so in his world, he pretends we wouldn't have to have it even though he knows we would. Because before now, before now, before now, Alex has always got his way. His need for a place in Scottish history comes before the people of Scotland's needs. And as I said, I feel for the First Minister his argument is falling apart in front of his eyes. His own backbenchers know it. His deceptions are being found out. No one believes him anymore. How can this country have an honest debate about our future when we can't trust a word Alex Salmon says? First Minister. Point out to the Chamber that in the that uh, at climax of Joanne Lamont's uh, question, she actually almost directly quoted from the Prime Minister. How appropriate that the Better Together campaign are even sharing the phrases. So let me tell Joanne Lamont something for nothing. I think, yes, it is worthwhile for Scotland to cover oh, its own affairs. I think it's worthwhile to escape from the welfare reform which is impoverishing our fellow citizens. I think it's important for Scotland to take its place as an independent member of the European Union. I think Joanne Lamont should look at the huge number of authorities who have said that over the years, which I've cited many times in this chamber. It is of fundamental importance that we elect the government that we want, not have one foisted upon us by Westminster. It's fundamentally important that this chamber and the Scottish people see Scotland as an independent member, equal with other nations in the European Union. Self-government for Scotland and proper representation by a government that reflects the interests of the Scottish people. That is entirely the argument which will carry Scotland in two years' time. <coughs> Question number two, Ruth Davidson. Order. Order, Ms Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the First Minister when he'll next meet the Prime Minister. First Minister. Uh, no plans uh, near future, but of course I met him last week to sign the Edinburgh Agreement. Ruth Davis. And on that day, I think your advisers told you not to look too triumphant. It's amazing what 10 days can do, eh? Uh, <laughs> for, for days, Presiding Officer. For days. We've had. Order. More ducking and diving than Del Boy from this man. As the First Minister avoids the conclusion that every fair minded person has already reached that he has misled the country into believing his case for Scotland's place in Europe 
was based on proper legal advice. Now, if we believe the Deputy First Minister, it was all a fantasy. This time in 2014, Nicola, we'll all be millionaires. But perhaps this politician of the year is less Del Boy and more Bill Clinton. I did not. I did not have legal relations with that man, Mr Mulholland. But the question here, the question Order. here, is that both, both Mr Salmond and his deputy can't be right. Either the First Minister misled the BBC and the nation into believing that he had legal advice, and then he spent thousands in a devious attempt to cover his tracks, or, much more seriously, the Deputy First Minister has misled Parliament by telling us that no such advice existed all along when in fact it did. And that is a resignation offence. So which one is it? Did he mislead the public or did she mislead Parliament? First Minister. I, if, uh, I, I think uh, about 12% of that question was the sort of question <laughs> we should hear in, uh, uh, in this chamber. I don't know if uh, Ruth Davidson was listening to the first answer. I tried to explain the distinction between seeking specific legal advice from the law officers, which is bound by the ministerial code. Uh, and what happens is I've referred to a number of times in this chamber, that is the legaling of major government documents. In the latter case, the law officers tell you what's wrong, if there's anything wrong with your statement. In the first case, they have to say what their opinion is. It's a very clear distinction, and I hope that, uh, that Ruth Davison uh, now uh, understands it. Uh, in terms of uh, the question of uh, Nicola Sturgeon and myself, you need prior consent according to the ministerial code. And the Deputy First Minister had that prior consent and therefore what she told this chamber on Tuesday is perfectly acceptable. I'm struck by the fact that the Conservative Party seemed to, to think this position on the ministerial code is something which is unique to, to this government. In fact, it's been carried by every Westminster and Scottish government uh, from time immemorial. It's carried across many, many countries. The very same precepts exist in terms of the confidentiality of legal advice. But I I've got here a, a letter from uh, uh, someone to the Attorney General's office, someone in Scotland, uh, a Scottish citizen, who was asking in the 21st of November last year, uh, Dominic Greaves' office, uh, about whether they held legal advice on the subject of Scottish independence. Uh, and the reply he got was, I am unable to confirm or deny whether this department <laughs> holds any... <laughs> like, I'll just say, to Ruth oh, Davison, what sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. Yeah. <laughs> Ruth Davidson. Sauce the, the goose needs is a panicked phone call on a Tuesday morning because it seems like a good day to bury bad news to get round the ministerial code. What is the inescapable truth? What is the inescapable truth is that neither this First Minister nor his deputy can be trusted to tell the truth. You know, maybe it's not Bill Clinton, maybe it's Richard Nixon. I am not a crook. But maybe the First Minister isn't a crook. But the people of Scotland simply cannot believe a word he says. And because of him, we cannot Order. believe a word his deputy Order. says either. There is one way to clear this up. The one way to clear this up is for the Lord Advocate to come to this chamber to explain what law officers were asked, what they said and when. Will the First Minister now take the appropriate action to ensure that Frank Mulholland appears before Parliament at the earliest opportunity? First Minister. I'm getting abused by, I'm amused by these references to American politicians. We've had uh, uh, Bill Clinton, we've had the rest. I'd have thought the American politician that Ruth Davidson is most familiar with is Mitt Romney. <laughs> Isn't he the one who dismissed 47% of the American population? Of course, Ruth Davidson dismisses 88% of the Scottish population. But then, of course, I'm also struck by the fact there's nothing new under the sun. I have here a... a a cutting from March the 8th, 1992, from uh, Scotland on Sunday. Uh, and it appears, 
On March 8, 1992, the Tory and the Labour parties were queuing up to tell Order. Scotland that they wouldn't be admitted to the European Union. And here's what the cutting says. A former European Court judge has cast doubts on John Major's assertion that if Scotland became independent, it would have to apply to join the EC as a new state. Lord Mackenzie Stewart, a judge on the European Court of Justice, yeah. told Order. Scotland on Sunday that devolution would leave Scotland and something would call the rest in the same legal boat. If Scotland had to reapply, so would the rest. And you know the really interesting thing about it? As I recall, that legal advice was sought from Lord Mackenzie Stewart by the Conservative Party. <laughs> so this argument has been going a long time. The question on law officers, the great thing about law officers in Scotland under the Scottish Government is they are independent law officers yes. in terms of how we conduct our affairs. They don't like the Attorney General, eh, like uh, the, uh, the uh, Advocate General for Scotland, go about in terms of the political argument. I think basically people in Scotland prefer the law officers to be independent, and I think we'll keep it that way. Yeah. Question number three, Ken McIntosh. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the latest labour market statistics suggesting that there has been a quarterly increase in unemployment in Scotland compared with a fall across the rest of the UK. First Minister. Well, there's a, a, a range of uh, measures which the Scottish Government is taking, which I, I know that Ken McIntosh has actually agreed with, cons uh, consistently calling on the Chancellor to boost capital spending, to accelerate recovery, create jobs and return the public finances to balance. That's something that Ken McIntosh, uh, as I understand it, uh, supports when he backed uh, our calls in the economy debate on 11 September uh, to implement shovel-ready projects. Uh, I would caution uh, Ken McIntosh uh, in terms of the, the statistics across the UK. Unemployment did fall across the UK uh, by uh, some 50,000. But we also know that there was 100,000 temporary jobs uh, for the Olympics uh, in London. It's a point that's actually been made by, by some of his colleagues. So I hope that Ken McIntosh maintains his support uh, for the Scottish Government in trying to obtain the capital investment to get the economy moving. Uh, of course, I should say at Ken McIntosh, it would be a great deal easier if we could just implement these changes instead of having to ask a Tory Chancellor. Ken McIntosh. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for his reply? Can I ask the First Minister if he accepts that 30,000 of the jobs lost in little over a, a year have been in the public sector in Scotland? That is nurses, police support staff and civil servants, areas of responsibility of direct or indirect responsibility of the First Minister himself. If the First Minister is not able to explain why unemployment is higher in Scotland than in the rest of the UK, can he tell us how many jobs will be lost, how many care assistants and teaching assistants will be lost by his 4.3% real terms cut to local government in this year's budget? First Minister. If Ken McIntosh uh, has really looked at the statistics as closely uh, as he should, he, he will know, for example, that the fall in public sector employment in Scotland is much less than the fall in public sector employment uh, across the UK. Uh, that's because we've approached things differently in terms of uh, central government and local government uh, in Scotland. For example, we have a no compulsory redundancy policy in terms of the government and its agencies and across the uh, National Health Service. Uh, so perhaps Ken McIntosh can turn his mind again to agreeing with this government that we need a different economic policy. We need to take the economy out of recession by stimulating capital investment. I do note even in the GDP figures released today, there's another decline in the construction sector across the UK. Surely that is proof positive that the calls by this government, supported by Ken McIntosh, eh, are on the right lines in terms of bringing the economy out of recession. But I have to repeat the point to Ken McIntosh. He must understand, he must accept that the macroeconomics of Scotland are controlled by the UK Chancellor in London at the present moment. Wouldn't it be better if we controlled these towering heights of the economy and could do something about the circumstances and help our people. Question number four, Colin Keir. To ask the First Minister what recent progress has been made with the four replacement crossing. First Minister. Well, the project is progressing well, remains uh, on time uh, and on budget. And people who pass the fourth can, can see the extraordinary uh, progress that's being made in the, in the new crossing. By the end of the year, the new overhead gantries, which part, form part of the, 
the Fife system and the M90 between Hall Beef and Admiralty Junctions will be commissioned. Improvements to Junction 1A of the M9, including the new west-facing slip roads, are scheduled to finish now early next year. Colin Keir. Thank you. Does the First Minister agree that Elaine Murray MSP's comments, which question the, ne the necessity of Scotland's largest infrastructure project, shows the shambolic nature of Labour Party's transport policy? <laughs> and will he confirm that the Government will remain fully committed to delivering this vital artery in Scotland's transport network on time and on budget? First Minister. Uh, it was uh, uh, an extraordinary uh, interview, uh, and I think we, we need to know, do the Labour Party still support the replacement crossing that they voted for uh, in this chamber? What are they saying to the 1,100 people directly employed now in that project or the more than 306 Scottish companies which have already benefiting from contracts and subcontracts? Uh, I think if you, know, you actually get to the stage that uh, this project is making such great progress, so much work has been done, 1,100 people are working on it, and the Labour Party decide at this moment to withdraw its support. I mean, do they want us to finish the gantries but leave the rest of the bridge? I would suspect the Labour Party want to get their act together, change their mind again, and tell people in Fife and Scotland that they actually support the new crossing across the Forth. Elaine Murray. You, presiding officer, perhaps the First Minister and Mr Keir might have read the transcript of the uh, article. Order. Or maybe even just the article uh, itself, because surely, First Minister, no fair-minded person <laughs> would consider that there was any suggestion that the project should be scrapped or even that it could be now that your lot have signed the contracts for the Chinese steel and the European concrete. <laughs> However, is the First Minister not aware that many commentators, including Professor John Kay at the Finance Committee yesterday, are questioning the cost of this is the question. Can we get to the, point, please? the cost of the project and its value to the Scottish economy, particularly considering your procurement policies. First Minister. Well, uh, I I'm grateful to Lane Murray for confirming that just occasionally your position might be misrepresented by journalists. <laughs> The thing I, I, I find difficult to understand is that uh, uh, the fourth replacement crossing is on time and under budget. If the Labour Party supported it at the budget level was expected, how on earth can they be withdrawing the support now when it's under budget, costing less than we expected? Uh, so perhaps uh, Elaine Murray could arrange for a, a further interview with the Holyrood magazine where she can clarify the position and we can come to the chamber. She is fortunate that she will not have to, uh, uh, she will not have to uh, account for the, the situation. I think she might just have to explain it to her leader in the front bench. Yeah. Question number five, Drew Smith. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to address poverty. First Minister. Well, the biggest threat to, to poverty in Scotland is the United Kingdom Government welfare reforms. Yeah. Now, that's why, in terms of action, the Deputy First Minister announced this week the creation of a new Scottish welfare fund through which an additional £9 million will be allocated to funding to be transferred from the Department of Work and Pension. That will offer a, an extra 100,000 vulnerable Scots financial help. However, I do accept, uh, and I think Drew Smith would also accept, uh, that uh, mitigating the, the whole range of uh, benefit cuts that are coming down the road from the UK Government will simply not be possible in terms of the finances of this Parliament. And that the solution is, surely the solution is, for this Parliament to have control over such matters yeah. so that we can devise the policies yeah. for the benefit of the Scottish people. Yeah, yeah. Hugh Smith. Um, can I welcome the Scottish Welfare Fund, although the First Minister will be aware that it is a cash-limited fund, uh, meaning that it is likely that it will continue to run out before the end of the year, and I think government officials have already confirmed that. However, the First Minister will also be aware of the wider Lens report released by Demos and Quarriers this week, indicating that there are thousands of families already facing severe disadvantage in Scotland today, including more, more than 10 per cent of families in Glasgow. Given the pro that progress on reducing child poverty has halted in Scotland in recent years, can the First Minister indicate what he considers are the key drivers of change that these families uh, and the communities in which they live need, and tell us what targeted support the Scottish Government is offering uh, to uh, these families and children, which might make an impact on that situation? First Minister. Well, 
Can I, I just point, uh, Drew Smith, to the fact that the, the changes we're making to the, the Scottish Welfare Fund uh, will help an additional 100,000 uh, vulnerable uh, Scots. That, that, that seems to me... <laughs> seems to me a, a lot of folk in Scotland. Now, I accepted my first answer that, that we cannot, across the range of benefit cuts that are coming down from Westminster, make good the difference. We just can't do it in terms of the finances of a devolved parliament. But on two hugely significant areas, uh, that's the uh, council tax benefit, where we were given control of our pensical council tax benefit, but with a 10 per cent cut. By an agreement with the local authorities, the Scottish Government local authorities working together are making good that for, for hard-pressed families. And now in the Scottish Welfare Fund, where we've had transfer from the work and pensions with another 10 per cent cut, but we've made up that with the, the 9 million over the, the period. And that seems to me great action by this government to try and do our best under the most difficult circumstances. Now, I make no claim that we can uh, compensate for every reduction in the budget by the UK government. But I hope when Drew Smith thinks about it, and perhaps I know he does because he cares about the issue, that the solution surely for the people of Scotland is to have control over these budgets yeah. so we can act in the best interest of the people of Scotland all the time, not just mitigate the impact of Westminster cuts. Question number six, Liz Smith. Minister, whether the Scottish Government considers that wind farms do not have a negative impact on the landscape. First Minister. Well, wind energy as part of the wide range of renewable technologies which we want to see develop will play a vital role in helping us meet our climate change targets and delivering a secure and sustainable energy mix for Scotland. That's delivering jobs and investment to communities across the country. Now, it's vital these developments are delivered sustainably. They take place in the most appropriate locations. We have a planning and consent system which is open, transparent, inclusive and which ensure that developments only go ahead subject to their impacts on landscape and a number of other issues being acceptable. And that view, of course, is shared across the government and by its stakeholders. Ms Smith. Could the First Minister tell us on what evidence, legal or otherwise, that he has based this opinion, given the admission by Visit Scotland that the building of a wind farm in Dumfrieshire could have a negative impact on the landscape, and given the substantial growth in the number of local communities opposing wind farm applications, which includes at least one Scottish Council seeking to have a moratorium on future developments. First Minister. Well, I, I'm sure that uh, Liz Smith wouldn't want to misquote uh, Visit Scotland. She'll have seen the Chief Executive say that the press comments were inaccurate in a letter to the, the, the newspapers uh, concerned. Secondly, Lisbon should know that the, 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 uh, the figures demonstrate that not every wind farm application is approved. They are approved if they conform with the, the planning conditions and the right circumstances. I can put in spice a, a copy of the consents that have been granted and the consents which have been refused by the, the Scottish Government which validate this position. But, you know, I'm kind of concerned when I, when I see the Conservative Party allude to a moratorium on wind development. You know, there are, I think it's now 18,000 people uh, who are employed directly in renewable energy across Scotland. What, what's the Conservative Party going to say to the folk in Macrahanish who are employed uh, building the towers uh, for wind at the, at the present moment? Is the Conservative Party going to say these people are to be out for a job, that they don't want them anymore, that they're being unproductive given the success of many of the wind farm uh, developments uh, in Scotland, including the... Uh, a quarter of a million visitors, for example, to the Whitley Visitor Centre uh, since it opened a couple of years ago. The other difficulty I've got, is this the consistent view of the Conservative Party? See, my attention has been drawn to the comments of Adam Bruce, the former Conservative candidate for North East Fife. He said this, uh, this year, quote, wind energy reduces price risk and cuts bills even when subsidised. It delivers economic growth, national income and jobs. The UK has the largest potential share of wind energy of any country in the European Union. We need more wind energy in the UK's electricity mix, not less. So I think the Conservative Party should do two things. Clarify what their policy is and then attempt to speak with one voice and not con the people. That ends First Minister's questions.